I'm here to give you the um, share with you the sort of the public health perspective on what's been going on with um, swine influenza at the human animal interface the last couple of years. Um, so I, we, I know this is uh, we've been going over this, but the the point I'm trying to make um, is that up to basically last year, swine influenza virus in humans was really quite rare. So from 1958 to 2005, there was this 47 years, and there were fewer than one case reported in the whole country per year. And then from 2005 to 2009, it was just over two cases reported in the whole country per year. And then in uh, 2011, there were 12 cases nationally. But here's the story from Minnesota um, through 2011. And you can see that we had the first case ever identified in Minnesota of swine influenza in a person was a, um, was a wife. Uh, mother and wife to a swine farmer in 1996. And that was a fatal case, and that really kind of opened her eyes up a little bit. And then in 2000, and then there's this huge jump to 2008. And then we started identifying swine influenza virus infections in people who have visited the live animal markets that we have um, in uh, South South St. Paul. Are you all aware of what a, a live animal market is? Well, well, anyways, people go to the market, pick their animal. That, I, that particular animal is slaughtered right in front of them, and then they help in the um, butchering process, and then they take home the meat, often in <laughs> laundry baskets and things. And so there's quite a lot of interaction with, you know, with the animals that they're going to take home. So we started to see cases there. We saw in 2009, right in the middle of the, um, of the H1N1 pandemic, uh, there was a um, case of um, not pandemic, but reassortant H1N1 in a swine worker, and I see Dr. <laughs> Dr. Hartman's here, and uh, we were together at a conference somewhere, and we were both just praying that Minnesota wouldn't be the first state to find pandemic uh, H1N1 in swine, and we were anyway, but it wasn't that moment <laughs> anyways. So, <clears throat> so then, you can see this is kind of how it went. These are the cases that you just saw up on this slide. Before and then suddenly in 2012, the story changed dramatically. And this is the U.S. cases of uh, variant influenza A through 2012. So you can see that yes, there were 12 cases in 2011, but when cases started happening in 2012, there was no way for public health officials to know where this was going to stop. You know, so so you had to do things that um, if you look backwards. You know, if you look at the number of cases compared to the number of people that visited fairs, maybe it wasn't that many, but there was absolutely no way to know. When our state fair started, there were like 250 cases already in the nation, and we had a state fair starting with a swine show. So that is kind of where we were at coming from in public health. And, and so this is the, you've seen this a couple times now, this is the epi curve for the nation for. H3 and 2V, and, and our state fair starts out in here. It was August 22nd last year it started, but there's always a lag in getting the cases identified. So we were more like over here when our state fair started. It was going zzzz, and we didn't know where it was going to end. So, um, so I'm going to kind of be flipping back and forth between the national picture and our Minnesota state fair during 2012. So this was the national picture. There are 11 states. Um, there are 39 fairs with cases. 309 cases turned out overall. 16 of those were hospitalized. There was a woman in Ohio who died. And when that woman died, the, um, the recommendations coming from CDC changed from, you should consider avoiding swine contact this fair season if you're a member of one of these high-risk groups to you should avoid swine contact if you're a member of one of these high-risk groups. And that switchover in policy happened just a couple of days before our state fair started. So the median age of cases in 2012 was six. And again, we've been hearing that children are, are more susceptible than um, adults are to this virus. Most, almost all the cases were 4-H kids or kids in the families with the, in the 4-H swine project. 5% of the cases were visitors to the fair. 
And again, the, the, incubation, the incubation period was typical for influenza, and it was a relatively mild disease in most cases. There were 16 hospitalizations. So this is another de depiction of why kids are susceptible to it more so than adults. So this is um, cross immunity to the virus, which jumps up right kind of in the middle between the, ten, the 10 to 17 year old group. So this is immunity to the virus. It gets real good and high when you're um, middle aged <laughs> and then drops a little bit. But so that makes sense because if your immunity is low, you're gonna have the most cases. This is the number of cases or proportion of cases by age. And, and so it makes total sense when you see that what happens to immunity at around 10, it skyrockets to this virus. So again, um, CDC came out with the recommendations that people at high risk of serious complications should avoid pigs and swine barns at the fair this year. And they defined high risk groups as less than five years old, um, over 65 years of age, if you have asthma, diabetes, lung or heart disease, other long-term health conditions, or if you're pregnant. So we've came up with some very unpopular signage for our state fair. Um, and we had, we had about, we designed these posters in one day and got them laminated and to the fair the next day. So you know, this is not an artistic endeavor by any means. Some people thought this was an X over the pig and not a barn door. Um, but it was bad enough. You know, it said, notice it is recommended that you do not enter the swine barn if you are younger than five, 65 or older. The same uh, risk groups that the CDC recommended. And then we came up with some very, very unpopular signage for inside the pig barn and uh, asking visitors not to touch the pigs. Now, I, really the, um, the efficacy of this recommendation is, is under question. Here's Dr. Tom Haggerty, who just does, he's the um, chief of the, the State Fair of Veterinarians, and he just did an incredible job with the veterinarians and with um, checking the swine out for illness and removing them and having them, and taking tests to the, our uh, VDL if they had influenza or respiratory disease. So this is what happened at our state fair and before. We, we jacked up our surveillance, and as soon as we sent out a health alert to healthcare providers to be on the alert for um, cases of influenza that had reported swine contact, we started to identify cases. Because it turns out that the in-office test for influenza for humans does not pick up H3N2V or most other variant influenza viruses. So if you come in to a doctor's office with influenza, They'll test you, and if you test, if if you have one of these viruses, you probably will not test positive, even, even though you have them. So here, um, the pig cases are in pink. Here, uh, this is August 12th, and we have two hum human cases of H3 and 2V, and here's another human case, and there's a pig. But guess what? It wasn't at our state fair. It was people who had visited our live animal markets. So then, when the state fair started, we had four cases of, guess what, H1N2V, not H3N2, and two cases of H1N2 in pigs that, that matched. And then later on in the fair, we had, these were all four, these were two teenage 4-H kids, and then um, two visitors that spent all day in the swine barn. A child that had a, a chronic disease and also a uh, grandma-type woman watching her grandkids show pigs who did end up in the hospital. And then um, here we have H3 and 2V in, in two pigs. Oh, here's an H3 and, and I'm sorry, H3 and 2 in a pig. And then we picked up two cases in people who were visitors through the swine barn at the state fair. Um, two, they're both children. So as I explained, the influenza test doesn't work for people in human health offices. And so we, we asked ourselves, how come we picked up cases of um, variant influenza in people at our state fair, but not in our county fair system? Well, this whole thing ramped up last summer relatively late, and we didn't send a health alert to healthcare providers to be watching for this until um, August 6th, which is pretty late in the county fair season. Um, but maybe the virus wasn't circulating earlier because um, Oh, we'll talk about this year in a moment. 
So we had some interesting findings. We were looking for H3N2V in swine exhibitors, and we found it at the live animal markets. Instead, we found the first human cases of H1N2V with the pandemic M gene, the first time it had been identified in the United States. We did develop some great working relationships that have continued through this season, especially with the, the state fair people. And of course, we always have good relationships with our Board of Animal Health and Department of Ag. Um, but we met people at the state fair we hadn't met before through, uh, through years of working there, 4-H um, people. Uh, we, the communications people from all the different entities got together, got to know each other better. We certainly did um, learn some stuff about how to deal with these types of situations in a way that hopefully finds some middle ground. One of the most important things we did is, like I said, those very unpopular posters, and I can totally understand why they were so unpopular. Um, we had to do something about that. So we got together and with this um, miracle of birth veterinarians, <laughs> and, um, and we came up with some verbiage with the state fair that we could all live with that would go on the outside of all the buildings. And when in public health, we talk about a risk message, and that is that people and animals can share germs. Um, a wash your hands message, which we have, a no food or drink in animal areas, and avoid hand to mouth contact. And then our risk message is now senior citizens, children under five, pregnant women, and people with chronic health conditions or a weak immune system should take extra care around animals. And this was posted on all the buildings this year. Um, and we stayed away from any specific swine signage. And this is the group that um, Jennifer was talking about. We met uh, January 15th and 16th. And I have to say that Dr. Coleman is the one who really got this all started in the beginning. And then um, it kind of it got steam. And then we met um, in Indiana. The, the document is meant for really everyone involved in putting on a, a, a swine ex exhibition. And it's got recommendations for what to do prior to the exhibition, at the exhibition, and after the exhibition. And these are measures that may be considered because <laughs> we had a two-hour conference call on whether they could be called best practices or recommendations. <laughs> and we decided that the, there was middle ground on measures that may be considered. So that's what they're called. And we also had um, two healthy fairs workshops that we put on with the Board of Animal Health and with our environmental health people at the health department for um, kind of everything you need to know if you're a fair board director, if you're a uh, fair veterinarian, if, you're, um, if you have to do with putting on a county fair. And so we had environmental health issues like you know water valve stuff. And we had animal health issues, the Board of Animal Health, Beth Thompson and others talked about animal ID and swine influenza. And then we talked about um, our favorite topic, petting, zoo, petting zoos at county fairs and enteric pathogens like E. coli 0157 and cryptosporidiosis. Um, this year, we jacked up our surveillance. We started much earlier. We sent a, a similar health alert to remind healthcare providers to um, send us a swab to our laboratory from anyone with influenza-like illness who reports swine contact. We set up a similar system as we've had in the past for sampling sick 4-H kids during the state fair. And um, we sent a postcard with Board of Animal Health, that's Beth Thompson's signature and then mine, um, reminding swine exhibitors and their families to that if they get sick to go to their doctor and get a swab sent to the Department of Health. And then saying that if you have questions about your pigs, contact the Minnesota Board of Animal Health and go to the document that we've been talking about. And we did get some hits on this. Um, after one of the two different county fairs, we got um, calls from families that had, were experiencing, experiencing respiratory illness. And they went in and got tested, and they did not have influenza. So we, we were glad. We thought, like, we thought it worked. We also had one 4-H kid be tested at the fair who also did not have influenza. And you know, of course, last year, we had droves of people with with respiratory illness getting tested. So this is last year. And I, to put it all in perspective, people, this is this year. And this is an overview of swine origin influenza cases in humans in Minnesota from the time that we first recognized that case in, in the beginning. And so we've had 
um, seven cases associated with live animal markets, six cases associated with fairs, and again, it's a combination of H3N2 V and H1N2. And then um, two from the swine industry, or you know, we're, you know, swine workers. Um, this is a person-to-person -person case, and this one we had no idea where that person got it.